So uh, we will have a couple of questions, uh, and then uh, please make it uh, brief and concise, and then uh, we get the speakers to address them. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, my name is Hong. I am working at the uh, CIM uh, in Vietnam. Uh, my, uh, I have two questions to address uh, uh, the Brazilian uh, ex uh, presenter. About, right? Where is that? Um, Mr. Emilio Laros, right? Um, I have two questions. First one, uh, uh, as uh, from your presentation uh, and also from my experience, it seems that for developing countries, uh, the state play a very important role in the energy sector development and also uh, energy uh, sector operation in general. Um, so. Um, do you think that uh, you know well, to implement the role of the state uh, in in developing countries, uh, the the state usually uh, plays the triple role, including uh, the the role for formulating uh, the law on uh, the energy sector development the, uh, and planning. Uh, the second role is uh, to uh, to be as uh, the owner. Uh, of uh, several energy uh, companies. And the third, but not least, uh, 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 the state is also the kind of the price uh, regulator of, of the energy. Uh, so uh, do you think that uh, this is sometime it could take, uh, uh, it's lead to the kind of the misleading uh, and make uh, the kind of distortion of the energy market uh, in general? Uh, and what is your opinion about that, uh, particularly from the Brazilian uh, case? The second question uh, relating to uh, the, uh, the fiscal uh, reform uh, on the uh, fossil fuels. Um, in many developing countries, as you know, that uh, the subsidies uh, to the energy, particularly the electricity, is very huge, uh, including Vietnam also. And um, uh, the, in the context of the uh, tr uh, development trend, focusing on green growth. Uh, so I think that uh, there is uh, the debate about the removal of the energy uh, subsidies. Uh, so what is your opinion about uh, the uh, removal of energy subsidy uh, from the developing, uh, particularly the low income uh, countries perspective. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, my question goes to Douglas. Uh, <coughs> this regards the, the notion of clean energy. Um, one is whether you, because we didn't release this at the statistics because of the technology failure, uh, whether you, you consider natural gas as, 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 as one of the sources of clean energy. And secondly is uh, whether you see the trend towards uh, more emphasis on uh, um, renewables uh, as potentially repressing the, the demand for hydrocarbons and what that means for the economies of uh, hydrocarbon dependent countries. Can we have the next question? Okay, thank you very much. Um, Channing Arndt with the UNU Wider. I have, I have a couple of questions. One uh, uh, for, for Doug on um, you know, increasing PV penetration and uh, you know, you're, not, you're getting power when the, as you mentioned, when the sun is out at low marginal cost, but not necessarily when you need it. There's the issue of storage and, and meeting demand. And I wonder if you could talk about that. You also mentioned electric cars and I'm just wondering if you could elaborate a little bit more on the, on the, the, you know, the timing potentially and, and, and the scope. You know, how, how big is this in terms of electricity um, uh, demand? Um, and then, Emilio, I, I didn't know Brazil had that high, but uh, hydropower output at, at 80%. And, and how, could you just talk briefly, do you, or, uh, is there seasonal variation, or, or, or how do you handle, like, you know, if it's been a dry year or, or whatever, how, how, how are the, how is, is that an upper limit? What's, what, is, what are the scopes for, for, for dealing with that? Uh, those were my couple of them. 
can we have uh, any other question? Okay, maybe we we address this once, and then uh, if you if you have any additional ones, then we can take them later. So uh, we can start from uh, uh, from you, Emilio. Thank you very much for your questions. First, I'll address the questions by our CIEM colleague. And uh, on the first question, I, I think that actually um, there are always pros and cons of state involvement. And uh, I think uh, the lessons that we learn not only from Brazil, but other developing countries, and also from the UK and other countries where the reform was done, is that uh, the important thing is to strike the right balance uh, between state and market forces. And um, I think that uh, for the first role you mentioned for the state, the formulating the law and the planning, uh, given the specificity of this sector, energy is well known for the indivisibility of the investments and the long-term uh, construction times and returns on investment, so very huge upfront costs. So these are uh, difficulties for the private sector to handle it properly, and the Brazilian case illustrated that dramatically. So I would uh, uh, say that uh, there is for sure a strong role for the government in the long-term planning uh, of the energy system. The second role of the state you mentioned, owner of enterprise, I think this is not very, uh, say, um, specific to a state role. We can't have the property, the private ownership by the, the, the market, uh, the business and the private sector. And the important thing is the regulation in this case. You have to enforce uh, laws and regulation in order that the, the private sector can deliver the country's uh, general goals. So, for instance, avoiding the predatory use of the natural resource, as it was the case in, in, in Brazil uh, due to the reform and living market force alone to tap uh, hydropower potentials in the water basins, this didn't work properly of, at all. And so the third role of price regulating, that's where maybe the, the, um, the experience has shown that the good balance is uh, what was called in the previous presentation to be at arm's length. That means that independent uh, experts in, in federal and regional regulatory boards. So because otherwise, if you leave it entirely in the, in, in the hands of the state, you come to your second questions. The temptation of artificially subsidizing uh, electricity and fossil fuel prices, which is a, of course leads to a lot of distortions. So getting to your second question, I can't agree more with you that uh, actually um, a number of reform um, uh, of reports have been shown in studies. The recently re released uh, a report by International Monetary Fund again quantifies the huge amount of subsidies to uh, uh, fossil fuels. In Brazil, this is not very high actually compared with the average in the country, and we have subsidies uh, being uh, uh, very important for the penetration of renewables, as ethanol from sugar cane and also wind through mix of feeding tariffs and tendering system. But uh, the important thing is that even the subsidies for renewables should be temporary that, and decreasing over time. Otherwise, you can't convey the right si signals to, to the market. And so, uh, anyway, uh, we have, for instance, now an election in Brazil. And to illustrate your point, the presidential election, you have 
now the inverse policy are subside, subsidizing gasoline prices to curb down inflation. And this is, of course, uh, means distortions. And uh, hopefully after the election, things will go back to normal. That means reflecting the true price of international oil barrel. And uh, in terms of... Uh, uh, of uh, your question, Channing, about uh, hydropower in Brazil. Why is it able to deliver 80% of overall electricity demand? Because it still counts upon a lot of huge reservoirs that were built in the hydropower plants built in the 70s and in the 80s. And at that time, there was even a pluriannual capacity of water storage. That means that you could keep water, and this would be the buffer point of the system to have the seasonal fluctuation. You have a dry season and you have a, a, a wet season. Of course, the country is huge, and the grid is being extended, so you have an interconnected system. So there are complementary season abilities as well between the Amazon and south of Brazil. So and this also helps. Now with wind, we have a huge problem because wind is much more intermittent than uh, hydro. Uh, in northeastern region, there is complementary between wind seasonality and hydropower, but not in other parts of the country. And the, the uh, big problem now is that due to environment concerns, the remaining hydropower potential to be tapped is in the Amazon. And so Brazilian society does not allow it anymore the power sector to build very large reservoirs. They are simply not accepted. There are no environmental license to that. So the, we keep doing very large hydropower plants, but actually run off the river with uh, bulb turbines. And uh, this has considerably affected this uh, capacity of uh, hydropower to deliver and, and to overcome the season or the uh, variation of supply. So we count upon some thermal complementary. So we are in a transition from a hydro system to a hydrothermal. That means that natural gas will provide 20 to 30 percent in the future. That's more or less the prospects. Thank you. Okay. Okay. I'll, uh, I'll try to get the last two, uh, but let me let me also comment on the first question. Um, I think because there are, are uh, there are many different institutional approaches toward the development of a power and or the broad energy sector that are applicable in developing countries that uh, can be learned uh, elsewhere. So, for example. Uh, the U.S. Uh, took a very different approach than a state-owned enterprise. They offered uh, monopoly uh, service districts uh, that were then regulated. Uh, those monopolies uh, became quasi, uh, uh, well, fundamentally private companies, but they were guaranteed service revenues and rate of return returns uh, and therefore could go to the private uh, capital markets to raise money, uh, which many uh, consumers, residential uh, investors uh, actually uh, invested in through bonds. Uh, that was a very different model than a state-owned uh, model. It was a regulated model. Uh, with a, a monopolized service territory. Um, the ability, uh, I think, frankly, today of rethinking what that paradigm is or multiple paradigms is, I think, very important uh, because there is ample private sector money that's interested and willing uh, to be put uh, toward investment in infrastructure and particularly energy infrastructure. As long as there is appropriate rule of law and a surety of uh, the, the revenue streams uh, that could come back to them over many decades. 
uh, and that's proven out now uh, much more substantially than uh, I'll call it the uh, the prior paradigm of a state-owned enterprise that had to invest in that infrastructure. So I think that's worth some some definitive rethinking. Let me come to the other questions really quickly. Um, natural gas is not included in the definition I was using before. That's all. Uh, renewable energy technologies, maybe energy smart technologies as well, so smart grid and things like that as well. Natural gas would be considered part of the, the fossil uh, uh, part of that equation. So the 53% that I talked about in terms of market share is mostly wind and solar, a little bit of hydro, a little bit of biomass, a little geothermal. Uh, natural gas and coal are in the other 47% with a little nuclear. Um, there is a really interesting question uh, that you did pose about the, the implications for hydrocarbon uh, countries and, and export countries. And, and I think um, one has to look at probably two perspectives. The, the, the first is kind of related to Channing's question about electric vehicles, is what happens in the transport uh, sector. Uh, even if you look at uh, a massive expansion of the electric vehicle markets, uh, over some length of time, it's still from a very, very small base uh, and very likely to get to substantial amounts of the overall uh, new car market. And the new car market is a very small part of the overall automobile, medium, heavy duty truck market, et cetera. So there is a very long tail for liquid hydrocarbons going out for many, many decades. Uh, going forward, even in the most optimistic uh, set of assumptions for electrification of light duty vehicles. That's a different set of equations in the power sector where coal and gas have, uh, frankly, now near term competitive uh, uh, options uh, in many countries, not every country, in many countries. Uh, and it bodes to the other part of that equation around sustainability, water and climate change. And therefore, there's a, a real imperative, I think, for those exporting countries and those con uh, companies which are in those fossil fuel industries to really think about what does their future look like in a carbon-constrained world and whether or not they should be investing more vertically rather than just thinking about them as a, a, a pure BTU or kilojoule supply country or company. Uh, that's one, one piece of it. And then on the, on the intermittency, if I can just go to Channing's uh, question at the end, um, as, as mentioned, you know, wind uh, and solar uh, photovoltaics in particular, both very intermittent. We have done uh, hundreds of studies, uh, not only uh, ourselves and our, our, our colleagues around the world, about how the system itself, uh, power system in particular, balances out when you think uh, even with, with much more intermittency uh, in it, uh, because of the natural variability in load and the ability to control load, but also the uh, geospatial diversification of sources. So sometimes the sun is uh, shining in one place but not in another. That smooths it out. The wind tends to counterbalance uh, the sun uh, sometimes, et cetera. It very, very high penetrations of, uh, of variable renewables or intermittent renewables. One does need more flexibility uh, from the thermal or hydro generators as well as more flexible load. And it's really more about ramp rates and, and more technical details in terms of how the system operates uh, versus uh, it being, quote, infeasible. Uh, again, it's just a change in paradigm, I think, from always supply meeting load to perhaps load and supply being much more dynamically balanced, so. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, any other question? Okay, as you think, uh, let me uh, use uh, uh, the privilege as a chair to ask uh, Emilio perhaps uh, one question. Uh, when I look at the statistics that you posted on uh, the pre-reform and the post-reform, uh, one sees that uh, the average per capita consumption, I think, was 442 kilowatts per year uh, during the, the pre-reform, and it became 499. Uh, and then when you also look at the percentage assets, 
uh, it doesn't look like there was that big change. However, the tariffs had changed significantly uh, from uh, $98.16 uh, uh, to about $178 or $179, if I'm right. So how would I, and when it comes to renewable energy, developing countries are very fascinated about the achievements of Brazil. So suppose I want to sell this to uh, the government of a developing country, that, well, everything else will not change significantly, but there will be a big increase in the tariffs. Uh, would it be a, wouldn't this be a very hard sell? If not, could you please uh, throw some light on it? Yes, you rightly point out to the insufficient progress uh, of the reform in extending access of electricity to rural areas and also the heavy financial burden of the reform on the low income classes. And that why that was why the following government that was more, uh, uh, say, uh, socially oriented has changed that. In the reform of the reform, the other figures, you see that this access of rural households has jumped from 74% in the year 2000 to 90% of households access in rural areas. In urban areas, it's nearly 100% already. So makes Brazil, compared with other upper income uh, class countries, the, by far the most uh, electrified today. Uh, now, in terms of the affordability, the reform of the reform has uh, uh, taken the approach of actually uh, finding who are the real poor. And this was done in the context not only of energy poverty, but also of a number of other indicators and using uh, local uh, authorities. And now the, there is kind of negative taxes that go direct to the household chief, normally the woman. The woman. And uh, so they have this uh, uh, so-called fellowship, I was called the family fellowship program. And it's, the secret is based on you have really the record of who is who and who is really poor, and this is, there is social control over there. So instead of subsidizing, for instance, LPG for the uh, rural women to cook, you now have true prices of LPG and putting an end to distortions because also in cities, some taxes were running on LPG, which is very dangerous because LPG was cheap. So this kind of distortion does not exist anymore. LPG has a real price, but the rural households have access to lump sums of money, lump payments, that go straight into the woman because she knows better where to spend the money. In, in, uh, for the family. So this coupled with a very strong enforcement of utilities that they have to connect uh, the households up to next year, universal access, that's the law. And of course, huge also public funding that uh, makes life easier for utilities to meet that target. This was uh, uh, then the result of this reform of the reform, making it possible to uh, uh, strongly uh, improve the performance that you just mentioned, that was the performance of the reform in the 90s with just privatization and leaving market forces alone. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I wanted to give the, the opportunity to uh, Ye, uh, Ye do, you, do you have uh, okay then uh, let me give you that uh. so I just want to make a very quick comment relative to the last question and I think it's really important to recognize that um, 
that the question or the answer to the question uh, does not reside in the fact that uh, Brazil has a significant amount of renewable energy technologies in their generation mix because predominantly it's mostly hydro. And the situation uh, from their reforms through the reform of reforms to today, uh, it's a very different question. In most, uh, most countries, uh, outside of the fossil fuel subsidies that may exist, uh, renewable energy technologies as uh, are competitive, uh, a competitive option to build infrastructure and to supply power today when they weren't necessarily five or ten years ago. It's a very different infrastructure. It's a very different equation. The companies, the banks, the multilateral banks, and the private sector are also very familiar with them, much more familiar today, and comfortable lending uh, into those technologies, into those infrastructure projects. Um, and the, there's still a challenge, I think, thinking through who invests and owns uh, the distribution uh, of, of power, i.e. the wires. Um, is that a monopoly in a private sector owned company or is that uh, some kind of government entity, uh, again, that's regulated and overseen? I think that's where uh, there's some really deep uh, thought that needs to be put in place in terms of what is the role of a system operator uh, and a regulator, but not necessarily the generator and, and, and how that comes to be. And that, that takes some other questions. So. Okay, uh, I think we've come to the end of uh, this session and uh, you will all agree with me that this has been a very uh, excellent and brilliant uh, uh, talks uh, given by uh, these uh, renowned uh, researchers who have been working on this uh, in this area extensively. So join me in giving them a hand of, a hand of applause for the excellent presentation. Uh, thank you very much. So we bring this session to a close.